This is the In the Rabbit Hole episode archive project. What you're about to watch and listen to is a past episode from In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, the survival doctor, James Hubbard, joins us for a discussion on how to treat our boo-boos when medical help is not available. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. I'd like to start the show by saying that Our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone touched by the shooting tragedy in Colorado, including the shooter's family. I can't even imagine the horror of any of the victims, victims' families, or waking up to learn that your very gifted son has become something truly horrible. Today's show is not going to be about anything else to do with what happened. Next week, when we know more, we'll be able to discuss it intelligently. Until then, mourn. And in the meantime, let's get some great medical information from our guest today. A quick word of warning, I am not a doctor, and I only ever play one in the privacy of my own home if I'm lucky. And with that said, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Hubbard. James Hubbard, MD, MPH, grew up in Pontotoc, Mississippi, and now lives in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He's practiced family and occupational medicine in rural towns and large cities. Dr. Hubbard's mission is to spread medical knowledge as far and wide as he can so people are empowered to live healthier, safer lives. To that end, he teaches down-to-earth survival medicine at his blog, thesurvivaldoctor.com, so everyone can be prepared. He also publishes the health information website, MyFamilyDoctorMag.com. Dr. Hubbard is a member of the American Medical Association, American Academy of Family Physicians, and American College of Occupational Medicine, and a prior member of the American College of Preventative Medicine and Wilderness Medicine Society. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Hubbard. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. So before we begin, I understand we should give a statement of warning about the information that we're about to talk about. Yes, that's correct. The warning is that uh, anything I, I give is, is does not take the place of seeing your regular doctor. It's for medical information only, and I only give out general medical information. Uh, I never try to diagnose or treat an individual over the phone or internet uh, or anything other than when I see them personally. And the information I I give out uh, should be used only in a case where there is no way you can get your to your regular doctor or more expert personal medical attention. Well, great. Let's start with what prompted you to get into medicine in the first place? I, I, I've always wanted to be into medicine. Uh, I, first off, I have I had a great interest in how the body worked, uh, how actually things like red blood cells could actually carry oxygen uh, to the rest of the body, and it still amazes me how the how the body works. The other thing is, I guess I was a little anxious even as a, a child, and that I was. Uh, afraid that I would come across some sort of emergency situation where I could help someone and I wouldn't know what to do. So from there, it just kind of became a natural thing that th- that was what I was interested in and uh, was interested in it uh, really uh, from the get-go. And when I went to college, was uh, I, ent- I entered pre-med and went from there. What exactly is occupational medicine? Occupational medicine is uh, basically work comp, uh, workers' compensation, the injuries that happen at work uh, where the people uh, file under workers' compensation and then come to the doctor. Uh, so I do that sort of uh, injury type for them, and also if they have any occupational diseases, 
I also do physicals and uh, pulmonary function tests, hearing tests, and all that sort of thing that goes with that. Yeah, okay. Do you consider yourself a prepper or a survivalist? Yes, I do. I wouldn't say that I'm, I I would say I'm a medium at best. Uh, My wife does most of the prepping other than the medical prepping around here, and and she is very good. So uh, overall, I would consider myself a prepper. Okay, that's pretty cool that, you know, it's not too often that we really hear that both family members are involved in preparedness. And I think that's fantastic that, that your wife is certainly into it, it sounds like. She's been into it a lot longer than I have and has done a lot more and uh, really is, has, uh, like I said, built up the, the supplies and, and the other things that we might need, everything basically other than the medical. Oh, okay. So what gave you the idea to start your site and write your new book, The Survival Doctor's Guide to Wounds? Well, I initially started thinking about it after I uh, sold a practice in Mississippi and kind of uh, semi-retired. I worked about three-fourths as much as I used to, maybe two-thirds. And then uh, I started thinking, well, what what can I do? Uh, what do I want to do? And, and I had been thinking a long time about being able to provide medical education to people uh, outside of the field and help them. Uh, And uh, just over a period of time, it it became clear to me how much people need to know even the basics of what to do, uh, like how to do the first aid or stop bleeding of a wound and that sort of thing. Then from there, uh, I starting to think about the, the prepper side of it, and uh, any, really any disaster that comes up, how much people really know, need to know, actually more than the basics. If they can't get to a doctor, what can, what can they do if they have something uh, serious co- that comes up? Uh, how can they treat it? If, and it really came home with uh, watching Katrina. I'm from Mississippi, so close by. Uh, however, was I was living here in Colorado at the time, but still, uh, it just becomes clear that so many people need to know things when, when at, at certain times when they actually can't get to a doctor or even call a doctor or a nurse or uh, a medical um, expert. So true, so true. So, what makes your book unique? Well, my book is unique in in several ways. Uh, the way that I think it is most unique is that I go through the way that I would think about something. I start off with how, what I would do first and then look for certain things, such as in a wound situation, uh, look for how deep it is. Does it involve bone? Does it involve muscle? Is it bleeding bad? Is there an artery involved? Uh, is it dirty? Uh, is it big or is it small? And then I branch out from there. Uh, In the book, I give links to those various scenarios and go into those of what you would do if 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 a a particular type of wound. uh, I go into not general, uh, more specifics than generalities, and then from there go into what to do after the first aid is gone and, and if you still can't get to a doctor. So that's the other unique part about it is I go beyond the first aid. Well, I also, also have some videos I'm trying out on there. They're not, they're certainly not available on, on all the tablets just simply because things like Kindle uh, don't let you get videos other than if you get their fire or something like that. But, but still uh, I'm trying those out. Hopefully with time, I'll be able to incorporate them actually into uh actual ebook and you can uh we'll have to go through a internet link to get to them once somebody's gotten the book and everything there is certainly a way we'll, i'll throw in at the very end about how to once they've gotten the book how to get those videos on a more permanent basis so that they don't have to be connected to the internet but, but i also understand that your book was a bit of a, a family project so to speak your wife and your daughters were involved in its creation well, again, back to my wife, she, she knows more about uh, natural type treatments and, and alternative care than I do, especially when it comes to the nutrition side of things. And then I have a uh, daughter who is a paramedic. Uh, she lives in Alaska and has uh, 
trained uh, the medical personnel on the uh, paramedic side of that, and she's not doing that right now. She's working for another company, but she she has a lot of experience into that 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 helped that I went to her with for parts of the book. And uh, my other daughter uh, is my editor, and she makes it where actually people can actually read it. Uh, she'll get on me if I start using some <laughs> sort of a, uh, medical language that's not common for the ordinary person. Well, that's great, and that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book is that it was it was very easy to read. It was very approachable, and it was not, as you were saying, it was not laden with medical jargon, and it, a lot of it was to the point and didn't have overly burdensome explanations. It was, here's what it is, here's what you need to do, and I thought that was that was really interesting. And to dig into the book a bit, I, I read, as a rule, sharp cuts bleed more than dull, at least at first. I thought that was a, an, an interesting section of the book. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, and I, and I mentioned that because of how many people come in and they're surprised when they have a, a little sharp cut and it, and it bleeds so much more. And the reason for that is when you cut your blood vessels, the small, uh, small blood vessels or large blood vessels with a knife, it, does, it, it cuts them, but it doesn't traumatize them and bruise them up as much as it does with some sort of jagged, uh, dull type cut or tear. So, uh, they don't go into spasm as much, and they just continue to bleed. If you have a more of a tear-type cut, uh, I've seen amputations, uh, traumatic amputations that, that don't bleed very much, if you, uh, at least for uh, initially. And that's because that they've gone into spasm, they know they've been traumatized, and they've cut off a lot of the blood supply. The other thing that people probably know but sometimes don't realize is that uh, anytime you get a, a cut on the on the hand uh, or the face, it's going to bleed a lot more because there's just more blood uh, supply to those areas. Very interesting. The You had the topic of bites that kind of took me by surprise, and I thought that was a really great thing and something I, I was surprised I had never thought of it before, but certainly in events like what we were just talking about with Katrina where you have animals that are hurt, scared, and displaced, they're a lot more likely to become aggressive than your normal everyday uh, poodle that's sitting in the backyard doing little to nothing. And you also went on to mention that uh, that you should get preventative thoughts, and I thought that was shots. That was interesting. I didn't know that there were preventative shots, shots for human beings uh, as it relates to rabies. Well, certainly there are, and... Uh... People who uh, deal with pets a lot uh, are, the, are wild animals or uh, pet control and that sort of thing. They know about them. And you can get those. You can get uh, immunized for uh, rabies. Supposedly, it's not uh, nearly as painful a situation in an ordeal as it used to. Uh, but you can get immunized just like you can get immunized for uh, against tetanus and that sort of thing. Most people are going to wait until they come in contact with some animal uh, and that, as I, I put in the book, the ones that would be uh, more likely to have rabies. And, and then at that point, they can start the shots, but they need to start, start the shots uh, really soon. Uh, and that's the way most people will go. They'll be immunized against rabies that way. And there'll be a series of shots that they'll have to take. But you can certainly go uh, ahead of time if if you think there's uh, some risk of uh, going to be some risk of exposure. And you can get the shots uh, ahead of time and have immunity from rabies. Oh, okay. And you, you said something in the book about even doctors probably won't be able to cure it once you've been bitten by a rabbit animal. That. That was something I didn't know about. I thought that and we were talking about a second ago that you can get shots after the fact. Is there uh, more of an issue with rabies after you've been bitten? Well, if you've been bitten by rabies, uh, by, by an animal with rabies, then you really need to get, if you haven't been immunized, you really need to get to the doctor or medical personnel right away and start the immunization because uh, people don't, people who get rabies don't, uh, it's not a curable disease. Uh, 99.9% of them die. Uh, there have been a few cases, but they have been very, very rare in the one to two uh, range in uh, medical history that have lived through, and even those have had a lot of, a lot of uh, medical problems afterwards. So the sooner you can get those 
that rabies, uh, sh- those rabies shots started afterwards, the better. The only thing you could do other than that, if there's just absolutely no way you can get to uh, a doctor or any medical personnel, the only other thing you can do is wash out that bite really good with soap and water and hope for the best and hope that you're getting rid of some of those uh, rabies, germs, and enough where your body could fight them off. Uh, but there's no medication that treats rabies, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's basically a lethal uh, illness. All right. And you talk about, of course, pinning up the animal for 10 days and keeping an eye on it. And then I'm assuming once you did finally get medical attention, you would alert the authorities to that and they would then be able to use the animal to for further testing. Yeah, usually uh, and it depends on the situation. If you know the animal has rabies, then uh, obviously you're going to need to be treated right away. But but there is a kind of an in-between where that you can pin the animal up for 10 days. And if the animal is is not sick within those 10 days, then the likelihood that uh, the animal has rabies is, is very, very unlikely, and you're out of the out of the danger. But if the animal gets sick, then usually the next step would be uh, to actually send the head of the animal to uh, some people who can test that. Meantime, you're starting on your rabies shots. Uh, and of course, again, and depending on the situation, if, if the animal is sick, then you uh, and you can't do that and can't send the head off. And you've got to assume that uh, it could have rabies. Okay. And in the larger scope of that, that section on cuts and, and such, you talk about even a millisecond of bone exposure greatly ex- increases the risk of bone infection. How serious are bone infections? Well, bone infections are very serious. Uh, doctors take them very seriously uh, because if you get a bone infection, it's really really hard to heal uh and sometimes a lot of times you'll have to have an amputated uh, area that has the infection at the least you're going to need iv antibiotics because medicine by antibiotics by mouth are not just just not going to cut it and it's just uh, it's surprising obviously there are some cuts where you know the bone is broken but uh if you have a a broken bone you think you've broken a bone and you see any kind of wound next to the bone, and you don't know exactly what happened there, in other words, you didn't just cut it or something like that, then there is a chance that that bone could have, for even a millisecond, gone through the skin and become contaminated by the air. And at that point, it becomes what we call an uh, open fracture, which means you treat it as if uh, the bone could potentially get infected. Uh, So at that point, you clean it as well as you can, and you treat it aggressively with antibiotics to try to keep that bone from getting infected. Uh, because the wound could get infected and not the bone, but when, a, when there's a fracture, it makes the uh, bone much more uh, susceptible to bacteria. All right. That's definitely good to know. And you also had a, a section under there where it started with the heading of what if the outside color part of the lip is cut, and it goes on to to talk about mending that and such. And I thought that was interesting as far as keeping it straight. What is, what is the need for keeping that wound straight when you're patching it back up? Well, it's just, it's mostly cosmetic because uh, if, if you don't keep it straight, then the colored part of your lip is not going to be a straight line anymore. You're going to have a, you're going to have a jagged spot there and it's going to, it's going to look, uh, look noticeable. So one of the things you do if you cut through the lip is you try to make sure you line it up just as perfectly as you can uh, where the uh, border of your lip, of the red border of your lip, is the two sides joined together, uh, again, as, as straight and perfectly as you can get. Okay. All right. Very interesting. And there's a lot of, you have a lot of really great discussion on water in the book, and it regularly speaks to the topic of irrigating wounds with water. You even have a section on what to do when water is scarce. What is the purpose of irrigating wounds exactly? Well, it's to clean the wound out. And uh, we doctors think that irrigation is the best way to clean a wound out. And when I say irrigation, I mean a little bit of pressure into the wound. You can use a uh, if you can certainly put it under a faucet where there's some pressure, the wound under a faucet, or you could uh, get a syringe and squirt some uh, water in there, or you can get a plastic bag and uh, stick a 
a pinhole in there and then just squeeze a little bit. But that pressure has been shown definitely to help remove some of the, any of the smaller debris uh, that maybe you can't even see and also actually removes the bacteria. Of course, you want to pick out the, anything that's large in there or, or you can irrigate it out, but, you, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, just because a wound is looks clean doesn't mean it is clean. If it has been, uh, if there's been some sort of a possible potential contamination, then it's going to need to be really, really cleaned out well with uh, irrigation. And the more irrigation, really, you can use, the better. Okay. And how do we know how much water to use when we're we're doing that? Because we're, we're obviously talking about a disaster situation where we don't want to use, but we don't want to use too much, but we also don't want to use too little. Yeah, I, I think a good guideline is a couple of ounces to two to four ounces per uh, inch of the of the wound, uh, as far as how long it is. Uh, that's going to like uh, you probably need to at least increase that by five times if you think the bone is involved. It's really really important to to get that irrigation in there if the bone is involved, and it might be a little more if the wound is deep, uh, or if you think it's particularly dirty. It could be less if the wound is smaller and more shallow and and not uh, you're pretty sure it's not as dirty. All right. And also under the, the topic of when water is scarce, you discuss sterilizing it. And this is more of a, a curious side note than anything as far as do you think as a society, maybe we've become too sterile and, and that's in some way inhibited our immune systems? Well, there has been some evidence of that. I don't know that it is with with water, but certainly there has been some evidence that children who uh, don't are not being able to play outside and children who don't have pets sometimes have uh, more medical problems and uh, immunity problems and asthma uh, and that sort of thing than, than children who who do get dirty and have pets. So, uh, yeah, there is there is that. And then there is also certainly the overuse of antibiotics, both in in, in our food and uh, for viral type problems, uh, which makes uh, just um, makes bacteria they, they more resistant to the antibiotics and stronger bacteria. And it, uh, it goes into these super resistant type uh, bacteria that are around these days that are almost uh, resistant to everything uh, that we have as far as antibodies go. So sure, as far as water goes, though, you're going to you really you don't have to have perfectly sterile water to either drink or to clean out a wound. You just have to have it clear as as best you can of bacteria and other types of infectious type agents. So a little chlorine in there or a little iodine uh, or just plain tap water. It's perfectly fine to, to clean a wound. Okay. Good to know. Definitely good to know. And under the alternatives to water, you mentioned peroxide and alcohol and even liquor. And I thought liquor was the most interesting part of that because I thought that was just something out of old cowboy movie, movies. That uh -huh. really works? No, 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 no. You can certainly use liquor. It has alcohol in it. and. Uh, so it's going to be uh, it's, it's got some good uh, antibacterial factors just uh, for external use. <laughs> okay, good to know. So, as I understand it, peroxide is not the end all, be all that many of us were led to believe growing up. And I think uh, a good friend of mine that's been on the show, that's a paramedic, was talking about that it breaks up beneficial clots and and there's uh, some other drawbacks around it. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and maybe even when it is appropriate to use peroxide? Well, I think it's appropriate to use peroxide when you don't have the water to use. Uh, and we used to use peroxide all the time, a lot more than we use than we do now. And the reason uh, is peroxide can damage the tissue to a certain degree. It's not bad usually, and, and it's, it's not horrible to use peroxide. And some uh, physicians still think uh, it's the way to go. But I think the consensus right now is that things like peroxide – are really a strong type of uh, liquids, uh, such as uh, full-strength betadine or iodine, really can cause some damage to the skin uh, or the, uh, the tissue that is under the skin. 
And so it's better not to use that. And if you do use it, uh, maybe dilute it with some water. And if you don't have the water, uh, maybe use a little less if you can than you would other than you would have thought otherwise. Of course, there's back to the irrigation issue, and I think that overrides it. I mean, if you if you have a dirty wound, and all you have is peroxide, then you use it and irrigate uh, like you would water, uh, or if all you have is betadine or that sort of thing, you irrigate it again to try to push out and and clear up physically the the bacteria and any microscopic dirt. You also mentioned in there that you can use the sun to kill harmful bugs in the water. And what is it exactly? Is it just the UV rays that kill bacteria and other nasties in the water? Yeah, uh, UV rays is what does it. Uh, it's amazing what those UV rays will do for the sun. If you put it out there long enough, uh, you can you can uh, get uh, water clean enough to use for irrigation or are drinking either one. So. Uh, if you if you do it right and you keep it out long enough, uh, it can certainly kill those bacteria. It's amazing what this, the sun can do with those UV rays. Mm-hmm. It really is. And I, I guess, you know, if you've seen an old Coke can or leave a shirt out in the sun too long, it's you can always see how, how damaging UV can be to, to materials. So in antibiotics, you, you went into some good depth in antibiotics in, about the, in the book. And as far as what do you feel we should be storing in the way of antibiotics? Well, one thing you should store is just a general type of antibiotic, uh, amoxicillin, or I, I like uh, cephalexin or keflex. It's a generic type. It's been around forever, and it's good for most type of bacterial infections. It could it could treat strep throat, it can treat strep infections and staph infections of the skin. And so I like that one. Uh, the only thing is that rarely some people who are allergic to penicillin can be allergic to the Keflex. So an alternative to that would be some erythromycin. That would be another good one to store. Uh, I like, again, uh, the azithromycin these days, which is uh, generic z because they're a little easier on the stomach. Another good antibiotic to have around is ciprofloxin or cipro, and that can treat a lot of uh, bacteria uh, that from diarrhea and uh, also some things that the, the Keflex can't treat. Uh, and I would say that if those would be the three, uh, either amoxicillin, but my preference is cephalexin since it helps hit strep better, and cipro and uh, erythromycin. Now, there is a bacteria out there called MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph, and it is in the community, and it is resistant to a lot of antibiotics. It's one of those that I was talking about that has become kind of a, a super resistant. Fortunately, it's sensitive to sulfur medications usually. It's also sensitive to bupirocin or Bactroban, uh, which is an ointment. It's a prescription type of ointment. So if I had a if I had a uh, choice, I would use the uh, cephalexin, erythromycin, uh, maybe some cipro and some sulfa and some mupirocin. If I had to break that down to just say two, I would say the cephalexin and the mupirocin. You know, it's funny you mentioned the the different superbugs. It's it's amazing how many news articles a day come out about that. I have a bunch of Google alerts set up for that, and I, I, every day there's at least 10 different reports about what's going on in the world with the different superbugs or the different names they're calling it. But, uh, yeah, it's some nasty stuff. So how do we store these antibiotics? What, do we, what would you recommend? I don't know a lot of medications that store in a cool, dark place. Is that pretty much the same for antibiotics, or is there more we should know about that? No, that's cooled our place. Don't let them uh, freeze and don't let them uh, get too too hot. Uh, just a cooled dark place is best. Certainly, they. I think most studies have shown they're even effective for quite a while after their expiration date if they're stored that way. Definitely good to know. And as for those of us that don't have a, a dope slip at our disposable, how do we obtain antibiotics legally, of course? 
Well, that's that's going to be up to the individual, I think. Certainly some doctors probably will give you some antibiotics, uh, a prescription to, to keep handy. Uh, I don't think they're going to give you a, a big amount. I think people are just going to have to figure out on their own how to get those. Some people, of course, use the, the uh, fish antibiotics. Uh, I can't recommend those, but I, uh, I see where some people have used them and, and actually taken them and, and done fine with them. And really something like the mupuricin, I think most doctors would certainly give you a prescription for that to have handy. And uh, you're just going to have to accumulate some over a period of time, I think. You had a honey as a, is it, am I using this? Is it antibiotic or would it be an antiseptic, which would be the appropriate word to use there? Well, I think it's an antibiotic. I think it's a topical antibiotic. I think that uh, you would call the mucuricin that and you would call uh, honey that. Honey is used in a lot of specialty nursing type facilities that treat really bad ulcers that have developed from diabetes or are really bad cuts that won't heal. It's great in that, uh, of course, you can you can get it without a prescription, and it has uh, antibacterial uh, properties. Some have more than others. The Manuka, M-A-N-U-K-A, is one that is touted and used by a lot of the uh, nursing facilities, I think. But there are others out there that are good for that. And uh, actually, uh, sugar is also a possibility. It, it helps heal infections. And, uh, and it is a good antibacterial. Uh, it helps dehydrate the bacteria, and then there's actually some some antibacterial effects other than that that help it heal. Neat. So the these specific brands are good, but would you say that pretty much any honey off the shelf and from your local grocery store would work well too? Yeah, in my opinion, that any any honey like that will work. The only thing about the honey is that it can it can potentially have a few uh, botulism spores. Now, that sounds really bad, but but it's not enough. To, I don't think any adult has ever had uh, any problems or side effects or infection from that, and any honey can have it, except for some that's been sterilized. But it's enough that uh, in the little people, like the kids under a year old, they've actually had some major problems with it. So I'd be really careful about giving honey or putting honey on a child that's under, uh, say, a year old uh, or uh, particularly small if under two years old. Uh, but other than that, it's it's great stuff. And, yeah, sure, get your get your local honey is perfectly fine. Okay. And, and I'm glad you cleared that up first, that there's not that much botulism spores in, in honey. I think uh, I ran the risk of my girlfriend rubbing it on her face, thinking it's a substitute for Botox or something. <laughs> no, no, it, it's nothing like that. It, 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 I don't think it's ever caused any problems with any adults. It's just the it's spores and spores mean that's the inactive bacteria that can't because it's got a got a kind of a wall around it and, and it's not going to it's not going to cause any problems just a, a few spores for an adult uh but a small uh baby could be different you also had a great section on sutures and this is something i've wondered for a while and i keep meaning to look it up and i haven't gotten around to doing that but are all sutures created equal or are there different types of sutures for different applications no there are all sorts of sutures uh, as far as the actual sutures, the, uh, such as nylon and, and uh, that sort of thing, there are all sutures and there are all sizes. And there are also uh, sutures which uh, can dissolve. The sutures that dissolve uh, tend to be much more irritating to the skin. And so we usually just put those in if we're trying to uh, close a wound from the inside, and then we're going to close uh, the wound on on top of that, on the sutures. Since we can't remove those sutures, we can put some in that will dissolve. But uh, for skin, for the top of skin, we put in uh, something like uh, nylon. Uh, one of the old uh, uh, ways was silk, and is still around. Uh, so we have that. And now that takes a little bit of expertise, not a tremendous amount, but you need to practice. And it would be best to have a hands-on course if you're going to try to, to suture something. 
A little easier way to close a wound would be with staples. They're skin staple guns that, that are used for medical use, and they're easier to use. And uh, for most wounds, they would be perfectly fine. Uh, I use them mostly on uh, wounds of the scalp. They just seem to seem to work well for that, and, and uh, there's uh, not any usually much stress or, or resistance to uh, pull on uh, wounds like that. Uh, that would be an alternative to mo- uh, su- other types of sutures. Uh, and then in the book, I get into what I think is a very uh, viable option, which is just taping the wound shut. All you're trying to do is approximate those wound edges together and keep them closed and, keep, and, and for several days until they start growing back together. So any uh, duct tape uh, is a great uh, tool to have handy to uh, put strips of uh, duct tape on the wound and just cl- close it uh, like that. I, I like to put a little uh, glue on the skin, not on the wound, but on the skin around it to, so that the duct tape, tape sticks a little better. And as long as you keep it the wound dry, it does a really good job. I mean, we, we tape, we don't use duct tape, but we tape wounds on the face all the time because they tend to not have that little suture type railroad track scarring that sometimes you get from from other sutures. So uh, there's the tape, and then the only time the tape doesn't work well is if it's over a joint or, it's gonna, or the wound's going to be stressed, and then it's going to be a little harder and left, uh, and probably the the staples or the sutures would do better. And then there's the glue, and certainly there is. Uh, medical type uh, bonding glue that, uh, again, we usually use on a place that's not going to have much stress on it. That's going to be, uh, it's going to not be trying to open uh, like a, if it's on a joint or something like that. And if you don't have the, anything else, you could just use some super glue and try that. To, but uh, I would, my preference is to use duct tape or some sort of tape. Uh, I think it sticks a little better than the glue. And just you say the super glue for those uh, small little nicks uh, that on the fingers and things like that. They just kind of seal it over a little bit and keep it from hurting. And how would we know when is, because I didn't know there's a lot of cautions involved in suturing something up especially. How do we know when is a correct time and when would be an incorrect time to actually suture somebody up or suture ourselves up? Well, of course, if you, if you have to do that on your own, uh, it's going to be a judgment call. But at the times you don't suture are if if you don't think you can get a wound really clean, if the wound is, that would be a bite or a puncture wound, those things get deep and are probably deeper than you can actually see or get to, and there's just no way to get them clean. Also, a uh, wound to keep open would be one that has a uh, that you suspect has a fracture, one of those open fractures, one that uh, you suspect has a fracture associated with it of a bone. And then uh, another situation would be if it's really, really uh, large or if it's bleeding a lot and you can't really stop it, it continues to bleed. Uh, because if a really large wound is just going to be hard to keep closed and if you keep the wound open, you can continue to clean it every day. You can pack it with uh, gall, some sort of gall or, or antibiotic uh, type of dressing to keep the oozing down. And if you close a, a dirty wound, then you're giving the bacteria just a free reign. If there's a little bit of bacteria in there, well, if the body can fight off small amount, and that's why you're trying to, to get it down with irrigation and cleaning to as small amount as possible. But if you have a, a fair amount of bacteria in there, then when you close that over, it's just going to give it uh, room for that bacteria to multiply like crazy. Uh, they have a warm, moist uh, nutrients, and next thing you know, you've got an abscess. Whereas if you keep it open and it does get infected, then at least that pus and stuff that would become an abscess will drain out, and a lot of times the wound will heal up with time. I just had an interesting section on pressure dressings, and for everybody's edification, what exactly is a pressure dressing? I mean, is it exactly what it sounds like? 
it's pretty well what it sounds like. It just means that you, you're putting a little bit of pressure on the wound when you put the dressing on. The problem you run into with a pressure dressing is you don't want to wrap a tight bandage around, let's say, an extremity because you could get it a, put a little bit too much pressure on it. If it swells a little bit, then you could cut off the circulation and you've got more prob- a lot more problems than you started out with. So the best way to do it is just to get some good bulky type gauze or, or some sort of cotton type dressing and then just press it down and press it good with, uh, tape it down really good, but just don't tape it all the way across. And the reason for the press, uh, pressure dressing is to keep any oozing of blood down. Uh, and if there's just a little oozing, usually it'll do a really good job of that. Okay. And I've also seen a lot of these like Israeli battle dressings and other things that, that will put pressure and things on various wounds. What's your opinion on those? I think they're great. I, I think that uh, those are Israeli dressings uh, and anything like that are great. Again, though, you have to have a little expertise. You have to know what you're doing, and you don't want to get the wound too tight for too long. Uh, when you're talking about something uh, that's going to wrap all the way around the arm, uh, then you've got to be careful that you're not making a tourniquet. And sometimes if, you, if you're going to need to make a tourniquet, then you need to know that if you don't let off the pressure every uh, a few minutes, that you're going to run the risk of a lack of blood supply to uh, the part that the distal part, uh, say your fingers or, or whatever that uh, run distal to that dressing, and you could actually cause damage or even uh, lose one. Yeah, I was going to bring up tourniquets. You had a, a, some good information on that as well, and definitely the information about loosening them. As I understand it, once a tourniquet's been on for a certain amount of time, it can also create an issue where if you let off the pressure, there's a, what is it, a backflow of toxins back into the system. Is that correct? Well, I don't know how much I really would think that was a a real danger. It depends on uh, the the situation, but on on a cut, Typically, almost all cuts you can stop with just direct pressure with your hand. But if you can't do that, uh, then and you and the, there's enough bleeding where you think that uh, it that could lose enough blood that it would actually uh, be life threatening, then you can do, uh, put the tourniquet on. And what you're doing when you put the tourniquet on is you're cutting off the blood supply. And if you cut off the blood supply long enough. Anything that uh, is not getting that blood supply is going to die, any part of that tissue. So you're going to have to let it on and off, on and off, on and off to get get some uh, blood. And you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do next if you put a tourniquet on. What, uh, what is your plan down the road? Because uh, if, if it's a really big artery and it's not going to stop bleeding, then the tourniquet is is an option. But uh, you got to know the consequences. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I guess speaking of tourniquets and deep cuts and such, you had a section on veins and arteries. Why is it important to know the difference between veins and arteries? Because veins are much easier to uh, get to stop bleeding. And if you cut a vein, it's not nearly as important to your body as if you cut an artery. Veins carry blood. Uh, that has already been, the oxygen has been used up. They carry it back to the heart to get through the heart and lungs for reoxygenation. And their their walls are, are much thinner. And unlike arteries, their walls don't actually pump. So if you cut a vein, it's not it's going to be easier to stop bleeding. And it's not essential to one vein or, or a, a fairly small vein. It's not going to be essential to uh, get those nutrients to your tissue. Uh, if you cut an artery and the artery is, you know, more than just a, a very small one, and number one, you're going to know it because it pumps. It actually, the, the walls of the artery actually pump on their own, and they're thicker, and they're harder to stop uh, bleeding. And it's going to take longer for you to uh, to stop it, either if you just use direct pressure or however you uh, decide to stop it. And if it's a really pretty good size, large artery, and especially in an extremity, it could be the supply that 
uh, the main supply of uh, oxygen and nutrients to the area that runs distal to that into the into the hand or to the fingers or whatever. And so at that point, uh, uh, you're going if you don't get it fixed, if you don't have some, uh, you know, get to a surgeon who could put that back together, then there's a chance you're going to uh, lose some tissue and even lose part of your extremity. Hmm. In your section on additional preparedness tips, you mentioned keeping tetanus shots current. And I think that's something we could all probably do well to remember more often to do. But how long do are tetanus shots actually good for? Tetanus shots are good for about 10 years. I, my suggestion is that uh, you try to keep them up, especially if you're, you're in the prepper mode. For, uh, you try to keep them, get one about every seven years. That way you've got a little little play with it. Uh, they probably last a little longer than 10 years, uh, but they, they certainly weaken at that point. And uh, you're, you're more prone to tetanus. And tetanus is kind of like uh, rabies. Uh, if you, it's a virus. You get it, and it's very, very serious. There are probably a few more lives saved that have had tetanus than have had rabies, but it's still very, very serious. And there's no real treatment for it other than prevent it by getting the immunizations. And these days, I'm going to have a, a blog post here soon. Uh, I guess it depends on what you think about it before, as far as immunizations, which you might want to consider once you get a tetanus shot to see if uh, they have a combination tetanus and pertussis, whooping cough shot. Those are usually common combinations. They're given as children, but whooping cough is starting to become a uh, problem and even epidemic in some parts. And the immunization wears off really quickly. So at this point, it might, my opinion is it's a good idea uh, to ask. Not not all doctors are going to have that because it's more expensive. And in the past, we haven't typically combined them, uh, given that combination shot to adults, only to children. But it's become, a, uh, as pertussis, uh, whooping cough has become more and more of a problem. You might want to consider that. But back to the tetanus, uh, you want to you get that at least every 10 years. My advice is every seven. And, you know, as long as we were talking about whooping, whooping cough making a, a comeback, are pandemics and, and that sort of thing something that weighs on your mind heavily? I don't know that it weighs on my mind heavily, but I certainly think about it. And I certainly think that if there is a, a disaster and people become in, in, closed, uh, in closed spaces for long periods of time, this can become much more of a problem. As far as things like the flu, every uh, every few years, that's a big worry, and I'm sure one of these days it's really going to uh, really hit the fan that uh, the flu is going to hit so badly that there is a pandemic. Uh, I just don't know how to predict that, and the only thing I can do is is uh, suggest uh, giving immunizations for the flu. But uh, then again, a lot of times they still don't work so well. But I still take mine every year. Uh, because I'm around it so much, and I haven't had the, the flu uh, since I started taking them back in, in medical school. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. Oddly enough, after I had uh, sleep apnea surgery and after they took out my tonsils, adenoids, and all that fun stuff, basically rotorooted the inside of my face, I haven't, I think I've caught one cold since, and that's been about eight years, oddly oh. enough. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah. You know, I, some people who say they have their tonsils and adenoids out, they, they tend to uh, tout that as helping quite a bit. So uh, in your case, I guess you're living proof. Yeah, I guess so. I got lucky with it. So and you also have some other books. I mean, this this book that we've been talking about today wasn't your only book, as I understand it. You have a series. Is, is this a planned series of books that you have coming out? Yes. In fact, I have another one uh, out right now, and it's uh, on uh, the survival doctor's guide to burns uh it gives the the first aid for burns and it's just like cuts uh, i think that you're going to need to really memorize and, and have it uh, just almost as a reflex just a few little things to do for a burn just like you do for a cut uh because when it happens uh, you're going to be in the pain pain mode and, and certainly not going to be thinking straight for right away and so you need to say okay when i get that cut, put pressure on it right away. When I get that burn, I'm going to cool it off with water. I'm not going to put some sort of ointment or butter or anything like that. I'm just going to get it cool as soon as I can. 
And I go into some things like that into the uh, and the burn book. And then uh, I also go into other types of burns, uh, whether it's uh, first, second, or third degree, and what you should do. And if you can't get to the doctor, uh, what to do uh, long term to try to get it to heal. The major thing I see about burns, other than pain, is infection. And the way, if you can keep the infection down and prevent it, then you've done. Then a lot of times that burn. It's going to heal unless you have a third degree, and third degree means it's gone into the soft tissue and into the nerves, and surprisingly, a lot of those don't hurt nearly as bad as the uh, the first and second degrees, uh, but they are serious, and they have uh, destroyed the mechanism that helps your body build back skin cells, so they can be very, very difficult to heal. So I go into things like that in the burn books and, and hopefully here in the near future I'll have a, I'm gonna have one out uh again on the theme of skin which will be, deal with uh treating things if you can't get to the doctor such as how to uh lance a boil or iron abscess, how to treat an ingrown toenail, how to take a foreign body out uh, if it's it's just deep into the skin and uh, a lot of things like that. It's going to be more of a procedural oriented book. And from there, I'm going to continue uh, whatever I think that uh, the audience wants. I think it, uh, I might do a couple of children's books, uh, children's health care books here after that, uh, something about what uh, to do, uh, what, how to recognize rashes and viruses and, and what to do and what to treat, uh, how to best treat and keep uh, people hydrated if they have uh, like a stomach virus and that sort of thing. So there's a, a, just a tremendous amount that I can go into. It's just going to be a uh, work in progress. Well, that's great. I can't wait to see him. I, I'm definitely going to go get the, the burn book after we hang up today and check that out and uh, definitely sign up for your mailing list as well so that I know when when the rest of your books come out and maybe we can even have you on the show again to to talk about it some more great medical information as soon as those are out and available. Yes, please do. I, you can get my books either on Amazon or you can go to my website and click. Uh, right now, they're available uh, on Smashwords, and pretty soon they'll be available on uh, Barnes & Noble, Nooks, and uh, Apple, and that sort of thing. So, and please sign up for my mailing list. Yes, I uh I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, it, it's at the website. You can sign up, and then, like you said, we'll, you'll know when the latest happens. That's great. And your website, again, is thesurvivaldoctor.com. That is all spelled out. That's correct. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hubbard. I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your great knowledge and a small portion of the fantastic information that's in your book. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, there are some good YouTube videos by Dr. Hubbard linked from the book. Before anyone emails in on how the internet will not be available in a disaster, I'd like you to consider two things. One, the time to watch the videos and learn the information is now, not when the disaster happens. Second, once you've completed one, you can get the videos off YouTube and store them to reference later in whatever manner you'd like. If you don't know how to do that, there are some really great articles out there on the internet. All you do is a couple quick web searches and you're set. And with that, we wrap up episode 77. Thank you for joining us today. This has been an episode from the In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting In the Rabbit Hole. Dot com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great survival stuff.